Well, hello everybody, Mike with Spray Jones. We're gonna come to you with another video today on closed cell spray foam insulation, specifically spraying down onto gyprock or drywall in an attic. Very popular subject. I did a video on this two years ago or more, uh, actually three years ago, and it got some traction and some people saw it, but it's time to freshen it up and review this subject. If you're not familiar, my name is Mike. I'm the owner of Spray Jones. I produce content on spray foam insulation for the spray foam industry, for the end recipient, the builders, the users, uh, and the guys and gals out spraying the foam insulation. So today we're going to take a look at this uh, spraying down into the into the attic. Now. I'm going to be upfront with everybody. I am not a fan of this. I never have been. And I'm going to state my case. I think I've got six really good points that you need to think about if you wanted to pursue this. In a lot of cases, it's totally impractical. So the closed cell or even open cell phone, but today we're concentrating on closed because most times people want to get a seal. They want to get a vapor control. Um, they want to get a, a layer of insulation down onto the gyprock, rock. And then they want to build up uh, cheaper insulation uh, on top of it, right? So they're asking, why not go and do this? Well, here's our reasons why we do not. Uh, the number one issue, number one of all, most important is access. Access into the corners, into the tight areas. So when you're taking a look at 412 and 312 pitch or even 212 pitch, you do not have enough physical space out towards the eaves, out towards the edges, to crawl in, avoid falling through the, the gyp rock in the first place, navigate all the trip hazards with all the wires and everything that have been laid out, and then spray your foam sufficiently thick and sufficiently sealed on top of the plate, the outside plate of the wall, and work your way back. You've got girder trusses, you have got uh, rafter heels, some of them not raised, some of them are shallow. You've got insulation stops in the way. And the tighter that things get, the more extreme of an angle that you're going to have the gun on. And when you have a gun on an extreme angle, the spray foam is not 90 degrees to the substrate. And as a result, it's going to want to skip and roll, right? And it's going to be very difficult to try and seal it into the most difficult tight recesses. Again, you're not there to do the easy spots. You're there to do the tight spots and you're there to get it done. Not, I think we got it done. We did the best we could. We hope, well, that, those answers are going to lead to problems. They're going to lead to condensation. They're going to lead to water problems. So access into the corners is by far the number one drawback. Uh, you just do not physically have the space. I mean, okay, fine. If you had a very steep roof and a very tall rafter heel, yes. And in those situations, we've done that. We've sprayed down. So it can be done. The second problem that you encounter is the drywall needs to be installed and the timing. So when drywallers show up and have their product delivered, they generally flood their crew into the job site and they go at it. They start with the roof and then they want to progress onto walls and they want to get the place boarded out within a couple of days uh, or a week. They don't want to come in, board the ceiling and not do the rest of it. So if you're going to be spraying the walls or doing other portions of the building, you need to have them come in and install the board and then leave. And they haven't taped and they haven't mudded and they haven't done any of their finishing work yet. They've just put up a substrate for you to spray to. So timing of that is a real problem. Number point number three is right on the heels of that. All penetrations need to be in. So every pot light needs to be in, every recessed fixture, ceiling fan, range hood, you name it. It's all got to be in. And no changes. Like once it's installed and you go and spray it, you're chiseling it out with a sawzall to get it out. And that's a real problem. And a lot of times homeowners are wanting to have changes or change orders or I don't like it or move it over to here, move, move it over to there. So you really have to have your builder and your end user make a decision and say it's going to be here and no different. To me, these first three points alone cancel this out from being a serious option. Um, I know some of you guys are going to disagree out there and, and say otherwise, but I just don't see the pros on the first three points. Uh, the negatives are going to far outweigh it. 
Uh, the fourth point is that you're dealing with a hot attic in the summertime and you are dealing with a cold attic in the wintertime in, in the cold climates. Uh, I don't know too many people that want to get up into an attic that's 100, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, we're talking 60 degrees, 50 degrees Celsius. The foam doesn't spray well. The people can't work. The sweat's dripping off them. They're, they're literally keeling over with heat exhaustion. Who the heck wants to be in that attic? So you know, from in North America, from let's say end of April, beginning of May till the late September, it's hot. It's hot in those attics. The sun beats down on them and it's going to be warm. And then you got to have lighting in there so you can see what you're doing and it's going to be really, really warm. So I think the heat issue is a real problem. And then likewise in the wintertime. So let's say you get the building up and you get it closed in and you're pushing just before Christmas and you're in cold weather climate. You're in Western Canada somewhere, even Eastern Canada. Um, it's sub-zero. It's freezing. So the attic is vented. It's cold. You've put the sheetrock up. You could be in a situation if you put heat inside the building or when you put heat inside the building, the sheetrock is just going to frost up and you're going to have a condensation point on the gyp rock somewhere and you're going to have non-stop problem trying to actually warm it up to uh, be able to to install. Now I know the foam, we've got foams on the market that can go to minus 10 Celsius. Uh, I don't like that. I don't like spraying in sub freezing situations. Uh, the reason being is that moisture freezes onto the substrate and you don't know it's there until it starts popping your foam off. So I like to have everything above freezing and how are you going to heat a cavernous attic space? You can't. How are you going to get ducting up into there? How are you going to get a heater up inside there? You know, with our method of spraying to the underside of the roof deck, uh, the heat, the building is one gigantic plenum. You stick the heaters in through the windows and through the doors, fill the building up with lots of hot air. And where does it go? Straight up. And you start with the roof and work your way down. So hot attic summer, cold in the winter. That's a huge problem. Point number five, pushing the gyp rock down. Spray foam, closed cell foam particularly, not so much open cell, very rare open cell, it's too light and fluffy. Open cell or closed cell will and can push the sheetrock down. And I have heard of this happening where it's been screwed in place, the guys went in, sprayed real thick, real quick, and they created issues where the force that they were spraying down pushed the sheetrock and they have a wavy ceiling now whereas before they didn't how are you going to fix that you can't you know the spray foam is welded the sheetrock to the lower cord you're cutting everything to pieces um you're going to be furring strips to try and straighten and put another layer up so it's just another bloody disaster if you go and put the sheetrock down with open cell foam you go and spray an attic uh let's say eight or even 10 inches thick of open cell foam that's not a product that you want to be walking on it crunches so when you need to get from one end of the attic to the other to service something to check on something to do whatever you need to do normally with loose fill insulation you're walking on it and that does wreck it over time you're trying to find where the lower cord of the rafters are and you're trying to walk on them so you don't fall through the roof but you are pushing the insulation and stepping through the insulation and 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 I've I've watched where condominiums have had people up multiple times, service people to to fix things, an electrician or whatever, in an attic, and they've trampled through the insulation to the point where it's lost a lot of its insulation value and they need to get it reblown in because it's it's been compressed down with so many people walking through it. You walk through open cell foam, you're crunching it, you're wrecking it, it's done. You're, you know, you've, you've ruined it. You really have because the cell structure is broken. It can't support your weight and trying to get from one end of the attic to the next, you're going to damage the product. Whereas with closed cell, it's no big deal. You can walk on it all day long. It's not going to cause any problems. So there's another thing to consider. Uh, point number six is who's going to verify your work. So you go and put the sheetrock up. Nobody wants to get into an attic and climb out towards all the work, all the edges visually see that the, the spray guy's done his job properly, gotten it onto the plate, sealed all the penetrations, 
made it consistent. Uh, so verifying work is far more complicated in an enclosed attic. Uh, the lighting is poor and what have you. I mean, obviously, if you've got a large attic and a large amount of space and you've, you've strung some lights in there temporarily and there's tons of room to work, obviously, that, that's not the case. And then a bonus point. We all talk about hating these R values and these um, prescriptive requirements that are out there in the building code. They're calling for R45 and 49 and 50 and 52. When you choose to put your spray foam down flat on a ceiling, not vaulted, not up against a roof line, not cathedralizing the attic space, okay, you are bound by the flat ceiling rules in the building code. So as a result, you are stuck with this R45 and R49 because they view it as a flat ceiling system. So now you're going to have to put in so much foam and then so much cheap uh, fill. My opinion on that is why put the foam on in the first place? Why not just put up a vapor barrier poly or some other means of system of sealing up the lower cord and then blowing the ceiling in conventionally? It's cheaper in the long run. So... I think spraying to the underside of the roof deck is by far the best method. We don't have any issues with the six and seven points that I've just said, and that is my slam dunk case as to why we spray to the underside of the roof deck almost every single time. Uh, unless there's maybe been out of 18 years of business, maybe half a dozen times where we sprayed down because we had lots of room to go do it. And what we were spraying to wasn't going to move around and shift. Uh, so it was a really good fit. So, Hope this makes sense. Uh, click on the share, like, and subscribe. Send this to somebody who's thinking about this. Comment on the video, and we'll catch you in the next one.